roughly cut timber, sourced from only the finest skips in Manchester, filled with the highest quality wood glue, coated in a fine layer of grey graphite pencil lead. Just a simple piece of wood with slightly rounded edges and a chip on one corner. Slightly rusted scaffolding pole, hand picked from a ditch in Levenshoom. Shoom, Levenshoom, 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 Hand picked from a ditch in Levenshoom. Fuck it, that'll do. Wrapped in a pallet wood frame and stuffed with a threaded steel pin. This isn't just any natural movement balance beam. This is a Movementum Natural Movement Balance Beam. So, what have I got for you today? Well, what I've got for you is a tutorial on how to make three different kinds of beams for any of your parkour or natural movement means. Means? Needs. Needs. Your natural movement needs. So, what I'll do is I will go through each of the beams from the easiest to the hardest to build and show you how to make them. And after I've made them, I will do a little demo of the beam and talk about some of the pros and cons of a beam of that kind. And without further ado, let's get on with beam number one, the easy one. For beam number one, you will need a piece of wood and a file or some sandpaper. And that's it, that's, that's literally all you need. My particular piece of wood was 40mm by 40mm, but you can change this up depending on what you want from your very complicated beam. And to make your very complicated beam, all you need to do is use the sandpaper or the file to take off all the sharp edges and anything that might cause you splinters. And you're done! Congratulations, you are now the proud owner of a piece of wood with slightly rounded edges. But is it any good? Well, yes and no. The benefit of this really simple beam is that it is really simple to make. But it does have some problems. For instance, it flexes quite a lot from side to side, especially on a carpeted floor, which is all I have. And if it flexes too far, it does this, which isn't very nice, especially for a beginner that doesn't have particularly strong ankles or much experience falling over. And it does the same thing if you try to do precision jumps to it. it. It's like this beam's trying to hurt you. You can instead pick a wider beam that's just a piece of wood but a bit wider than the one I chose, and that's fine. It's going to be easier to balance on and less good as a balance training tool, but at the same time much less likely to fall over. There's not really too much to say about this beam, so I think it's time to move on to beam number two. The other wooden beam. I was going to come up with a good name, but I didn't come up with a good name. I just called it the other wooden, wooden beam. Uh, beam number two. For beam number two, you will need some wood, a saw, a hammer, a chisel. But we do not throw our chisels because chisels are precise tools that deserve to be handled with respect a ruler or tape measure, a pencil that we apparently don't treat with any respect at all, wood glue, screws and a screwdriver, and a file or some sandpaper. You don't need these, but you may also want some kind of square, a drill, drill bits, and a plane. No, not that kind of plane. The piece of wood I'm using for this project is about 9cm by 4.5cm and as long as you want it to be. And the reason I'm doing that is because I have this piece of wood right here, which is double what I want. So I'm going to do a rip cut on it. And I hate rip cuts. They are the most awful thing you ever have to do to a piece of wood, in my opinion. In case you don't know, a rip cut is when you cut lengthways along the grain generally along the whole length of a plank, which is slower because of the way that a saw cuts, and is also just a hell of a long way. So I've measured it out, and I guess it's time to just get started and get cutting. <music> this 
this is taking quite a long time. Why don't we speed it up a bit? Nope, it's still taking ages. Okay. Nope, it's still going, okay. Okay, okay. A uh, change of plan. I've got I've got a new idea. What we'll do is we'll leave a clone of myself here cutting this piece of wood. And then what we'll get him to do is send it back in time once he's done to us now. So we just get the piece of wood now and get on with the project. Right? Cool? Okay. Good. Perfect. Now I'm just going to plane the surfaces a little bit to clean them up and get it ready for us to make beam number two. Also, side note, some of these clips coming up will have audio in the background of me cutting and doing things, and some of them won't because I decided to listen to the entire works of H Bomber Guy while making these beams, so... Yeah, that. So anyway... So anyway... I'm measuring and cutting two lengths of 30 centimeters as my two end pieces and then whatever wood is left is going in the middle. For this beam, I'm going to be using a joint called a cross lap joint. So what I'm doing is finding the center point of one of the end pieces and then cutting a slot, which is just slightly smaller than the piece of wood it's going to be slotting into. You'll see why it's meant to be smaller in a minute. To cut the slot, I'm first going to clamp it in to my highly precise woodworking vise. I'm going to use this cheap tenon saw that I bought from Wilco to cut the joints. And as it looks like it's going to take a while, why don't we go and have a look and see how my clone is doing with the rip cut. Meanwhile... A few inches later... Hmm, yeah. Still taking a while. We'll check back in later. Okay, so now I've finished the two cuts on one of my end pieces. I'm going to do the same thing on the end of my main body section. I'm doing it about five centimeters away from the end. And then I'm going to use my chisel to take the bit out of the middle. I don't know technical woodworking terms, okay? Just, we're going to use the chisel to take the bit out of the middle. You don't need to take this bit too slowly, especially for the first few hits, you can take off fairly big chunks, but as you get closer to the bottom, try to be a little bit more careful with how much you're taking off. You don't want to go too deep because that will ruin the joint. When you've got your slot close to where you want it to be, which in this case is half of the width of the board, just put your big fat fucking head right in front of the camera so that it focuses on the top of your head instead of the thing that you're meant to be demonstrating because that's clearly the best course of action. Instead of doing that, stop using the hammer and the chisel together and instead use a nice sharp chisel to just slowly take small little slices off of the joint until it gets down to the depth that you want it to be. Once you've done this to the end piece and the main body, of your beam, they should just slot right into e oh. Well, while I sort this out, why don't go you go and check on my clone well, and see if best. he's finished doing his cut yet. Meanwhile... Back to the beams, and it turns out that this was all part of my grand master plan. You see, you don't actually want to cut them to exactly the right size straight away because that will often mean that you might accidentally cut them slightly too big and, well, once you've taken material away, it's very hard to add it back in. So instead, what we do is we cut the joints slightly smaller than you want them to be and then again, use the chisel to refine the edges of the joint until they fit perfectly. Oh yeah, look at that fit. Tight, but not too tight. Why is this video gone all sexual? First it was the fucking Marks and Spencers weird sexy food advert parody, and now it's this. Anyway, onwards and upwards and away from the crude sex jokes. I'm just going to have a quick hoover up. So 
while I'm hoovering, why don't you go and check up on my clone and see how he's doing with that rip cut. Meanwhile. Ah, perfect. Look at that. He's just finishing up now. Now he can finally send that piece of wood back in time to the start of when we were making this beam. You know, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. And then he can have a rest. Or, as he's a clone, I can just delete him. It's easier that way. Can't really afford to feed another mouth. In case it wasn't clear, I did that whole cross lap joint thing on both ends of the piece of wood and both end pieces. So I now have one well fitting joint on each end of the piece of wood. And before I connect them together permanently, I'm just going to give them a file and a sand on all the edges and all the corners because it's much easier to do so when it's not all in one piece. To strengthen this joint and to make it a little bit easier to glue together, I'm going to be using one screw at each end. Now this screw needs to... Now this screw need... Now this screw needs to be longer than half of the width of the piece of wood that you're using but obviously not longer than the width of your wood because otherwise it will either stab you in the foot or stab the floor. For these screws I'm going to be doing a pilot hole and then using a bigger drill bit to do a small countersink. Then I'm going to pull the joint apart, cover it in lashings of wood glue, spread it around with a paintbrush, slap it back together and screw it all together. Together together. What an amazing use of vocabulary. And with that, it's done. So let's put this beam through its paces and see what it can do. One thing to mention about this beam is that it works best when it's this way up. Simply put, when you use the beam this way up, the joints are being pushed together, which makes them a lot stronger. So on to how this beam performs. Overall, this beam is great. And to tell the truth, there are only two flaws I can even find with it. And they aren't even really flaws, they're just things that mean you might want to use a different beam instead, and one of them is my own fault. And they are that this beam is a little bit too short, just make a longer one, pretty easily solved. And the other thing is that the top is square and not rounded, which might be perfect for you, depending on what your goals are and the level that you are at currently. For me, I prefer a beam with a rounded top because it's a little bit more challenging. And that's it. On to the pros. And the pros are that it is exactly what it looks like. It's strong, it doesn't wobble, and it's perfect for practicing your balance on or jumping to. It's not going to break, it's not going to slip unless you jump at it with a really steep angle. And even then, you can probably find something to weigh it down or something to put behind it. You can even put it against a wall and it will work perfectly. It's also quite light and easy to move around and store. I'd rate it 4.962146252294 out of 5. Would recommend. And now it's time for this absolute unit of a beam. It's big, it's heavy, and it's pretty awesome. It's time for beam number three. But first, do you remember that whole series of shenanigans I had to go through where I cloned myself and then left my clone to do the rip cut on that really slow to cut piece of wood? Well, I need some more of that wood, so I need to do another rip cut. And it's almost 30 degrees C today, which is really hot for England. So I'm just going to get it over and done with. Wish me luck. Well, thank fuck that's over and done with. That was fucking awful. Anyway, what do you need for beam number three? For starters, all of that wood that I just cut up. And then, some scaffolding pole. Some kind of metal rod. Screws. Wood glue. A saw. A chisel. But remember, we don't throw our chisels because they are precision tools and they need to be treated with care. A metal ruler that we don't give a shit about. A pencil. A tape measure. A file or sandpaper, a good quality drill, a hammer, metal drill bits, as in drill bits for metal, not drill bits made of metal, a hacksaw, 
Some bulk croppers if you're feeling lazy. Some kind of square can be quite useful. A way to clamp things is always nice. It's always good to have a set of juggling balls on hand. And finally, don't forget the Poro. This beam is made up of three main parts. There are the two end pieces made of stacked up pieces of wood, and then the centre made out of a piece of scaffolding pole. I've already made a couple of these beams before, and last time I made a pair of lower beams with longer pieces of scaffolding. This time I only have one piece of scaffolding and I want to make the beams a little bit higher. Luckily for you, you get to choose how you make yours because they're made in the same way just with more or less wood and with longer or shorter pieces of scaffolding pole. For reference, here's how I built my initial beam with the measurements on screen and here's how I'm building the ones I'm building right now. There's not really much difference between them if I'm honest but I wanted to go for a set of beams that were a little bit higher this time. You know, just to add a little bit of variation to my natural movement diet. So what I'm doing now is finding the centre point of each of these pieces of wood and using my square to draw a vertical line on the side face of the piece of wood. That way, when I want to assemble it, all I have to do is line all four of the lines up and I know that all of the pieces are in exactly the right place. The next step is to connect all these pieces of wood together and I made a bunch of small mistakes in the order of operations that I used when I was making this. But that's the great thing about YouTube. I make the mistakes so you don't have to. The first mistake I made was putting the glue on first and then trying to screw the pieces together. Why was this a big mistake? Well, I had no good way to clamp the pieces together so as soon as I tried to put the screw in they just slipped all over the place because the glue just acted as a lubricant and it was just a right old pain in the bum to get this first one done. And not only that, the other mistake I made was putting my big fat fucking head right in the way of the camera. What are you doing, Billy? Get your fucking head out of the way. And now I've shown you how to do it wrong, it's time to show you how to do it right, or at least the way that works for me. To build one of these end pieces, we need to start with the base and build up one piece at a time until we reach the height we desire. As you can see, I messed this up twice before I managed to work out how to do it properly, so I'm going to be demonstrating this technique with the topmost piece, but it's the same technique all the way up. Take the layer you want to connect and use the marking lines that we made earlier to line it up in its final position. Drill a pilot hole at each end of the top piece, making sure to at least go some way into the piece below it, but being careful not to accidentally drill into the head of one of the screws from the layers below, because that will really ruin your day. Now you've got the pilot holes, screw a screw into each of those holes until just the end of the screws are poking out. I know it's a bit small, but hopefully you can see that in the video. Now the ends of these screws work as locating pins. Now all you need to do is apply a liberal amount of glue and then put the piece on, line it up with the locating pins and screw it into place. Bish bash bosh, done. So much easier than fiddling around with trying to clamp it or trying to hold it in position with all that slippery glue all over the place. And then just repeat that process to get the height you want on both ends of your beam. After the glue's dried, it's time to make a big hole. A really big hole. A hole so big in fact that most likely you don't have a drill bit big enough, so we're going to have to improvise. Start by marking out a circle the same diameter as the piece of scaffold pole you're using. And then we're going to grab our drill, grab a decent sized drill bit, and then we're going to start drilling holes in a circle pattern just inside the perimeter of the circle. Now, there are a couple of ways you can do this. If you're lucky enough to have a drill press, then you can probably just drill straight through in one go and it'll be really easy. For me, I found the easiest way was to drill halfway through on one side, flip it over, and then drill halfway through again from the other side. Now the drill holes don't really match up when you do it this way, but to tell the truth, that isn't really that much of a problem. These aren't precise holes, they don't really matter where they are, they're really just there to help you remove material so you can get in there with the chisel. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm gonna get my chiddle, chiddle, chiddle. I'm gonna get my chisel and I'm gonna thwack, thwack, thwack away until most of that material has gone from the inside. Now, it's at this point you want to grab your file. 
In this case, I'm using a rasp file to get the rough work done and then a much finer file to finish it off and to dial it in to the exact right size of my scaffolding pole. As far as fitting the scaffolding pole into the hole goes, you want it to be quite a tight fit. That way, once it's all together, it won't move around too much. And on the topic of poles, now I'm going to cut my piece of pole to length. You may not need to cut yours. Again, when I made my longer beams in the past, I just used the length that I had already. But in this case, I wanted to make two smaller beams, so I cut my piece of scaffolding in half. We've seen enough sawing already, so cue the music. Let's get this shit over with. Twenty minutes later. And then my tools just started falling apart. Won't you look at that, this beam's starting to come together. To be honest, it works at this point. You could probably get away with just using it as it is. But there is one more step that I like to do for these beams to make them a lot stronger and to make sure that the scaffolding pole doesn't spin. I'm going to start by finding the center point of the topmost piece of wood and then get a drill bit that is the same diameter as whatever piece of rod you're using to hold it together. In my case, I'm using this piece of threaded rod that I found abandoned outside of a building site because that's what I have. Drill a hole straight down through the top, through the hole in the middle and down a short way into the bottom. Put your scaffolding pole into its final position with just a little bit of the pole hanging out over the end. And then with a good sharp build it, drill bit, a good drill and a lot of cutting fluid. Drill straight down through the hole you've already drilled and through the metal pole, through the top of it and through the bottom of it. Again, lots of cutting fluid, a sharp drill bit and a good drill. You probably won't manage it otherwise. Take your piece of rod and push it all the way down to the hole as far as it goes and then mark a line where it needs to be cut. I'm going to be incredibly lazy and use these bolt croppers that I found just randomly lying around outside because I can't be asked with any more sawing. File off the sharp ends and then with a hammer just to make sure it goes in all the way, whack it into place and then flip it around and do it on the other end. Remember, make sure to do one end first and then flip it around and do the other end. That way the two pins will be aligned correctly through the scaffolding pole. And now you have a beam. Congratulations if you've actually followed this guide. These are very strong beams. I've seen other designs around. Some are a lot easier to make, but I do really think that this is a very, very strong design, which I've put up to a lot of tests so far and I've yet to break it. So let's have a look at it in action. As is the running theme of this video so far, let's start with the negatives because I'm just such a happy person. Anyway, as far as negatives go, it's a bit hard to build and they're quite big and heavy. Other than that, they're great. Obviously, if you're a beginner, the fact that they are round might make it slightly more difficult, but that's less of a positive negatives thing and more of a personal preference thing. So what can you do with these things? Well, a lot, especially if you make a pair of them or in my case, more. I actually have too many beams now. They're just literally coming out of my ass. They're just everywhere. But that does mean that I have a lot of options. For one, of course, you can simply use them for balancing or jumping to, to practice your precision landings. You can also practice stepping from one to another and jumping around all over the place in whatever direction you feel like. One of the real benefits of this kind of beam over the wooden ones we made earlier is that they are also great to use as parallettes. In fact, that's why I made the second set shorter, but also a little bit higher, so that there's a bit more room to swing your legs through. 
The last thing that I really like about these beams is that the end pieces actually work great as kind of added bonus. You can use them to practice your precision jumps too, and you can even use the, I don't know what to call them, the, the wings, that I'll be highlighting them in the video, the, the bits on the edges, as a kind of precision step practice, because they're just wide enough to get one of your feet on. Again, this isn't some crazy revelation, it's just another thing that means that you have a bit more variety. Because in the end, although I haven't really talked about it much in this video, in my other videos I talk about it a lot. These, for me at least, are going to be set up in my home at all times, so that throughout the day I can step over them, I can practice my balance, I can jump wherever I feel like, and just use them in my everyday life to add a bit of extra movement in. Obviously, you can use these beams for whatever you want, but for me, that's what they are. They get moved around on a regular basis to create more obstacles and interesting variations as I travel through my house. And now I've got so many of them, like literally so many of them, I just, I can't really go anywhere without standing on one. And it means that in these fairly sedentary COVID times, I have a bit more options, a bit more options, a few more options. And this video is getting a bit long now, and to tell the truth, this video has taken me much, much, much too long to make between me procrastinating and having a fairly serious crash where I lost all the audio for this video and all the editing I've done so, so far. Luckily, I still had all the clips, so I could put it back together, but it was a bit disheartening. Anyway, I have lots and lots and lots more topics that I want to talk about that aren't about making things and are more about movement and health and more of the kind of topics you've possibly seen from my other videos. So on that note, thank you very much for watching. Um, like, subscribe, notification bell, whatever else you're meant to do as a YouTuber. Is there anything else at this point? Quite possibly. On this note, on that note, on some note, goodbye.